All right, welcome everybody to Forest Pest Hunters uh, Fall 2023 Training Surveying for Beach Leaf Disease. My name is Sean Kittle. I am the Communications Coordinator with the Adirondack Park Invasive Program, and I'm going to be giving you a little introduction here today, and then I'm going to hand it off. So yeah, today we're going to do this brief introduction, and then we're going to get right into beach leaf disease. Uh, we're going to talk about history, identification, and research. And then we're going to talk about surveying for beach leaf disease, which is really important right now. If you saw the recent news, uh, the second confirmed case of beach leaf disease uh, recently happened in Warren County. So we more than ever, we need people out there looking for beach leaf disease. Uh, then we're going to get into adopting a trail and using IMAP invasives, which you'll use to report any sightings or non sightings of beach leaf disease. And then we'll have time for a Q&A. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the comments section. I will be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation, and I will make sure that everybody's uh, questions are answered at the end. Today's speakers. Uh, first up, we have Maria Moskali. She's with the Department of Environmental Conservation. She's a forest health specialist. We have Becca Bernacki. She's with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. She's the Terrestrial Invasive Species Coordinator, or is it Project Coordinator? Project coordinator. Technology. Project coordinator. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Mitch O'Neill with the New York uh, Natural Heritage Program. He's on the IMAP Invasive Project team. Very good. He's given this uh, talk a couple of times. Uh, right before we start, I want to give a shout out to the Adirondack Mountain Club. Uh, they co-sponsor the event. They've done a great job helping us promote it. And of course, the IMAP Invasives and DEC for being here and helping us out. And lastly, after this presentation, the webinar will be online. It'll be on uh, APIP's YouTube channel, usually within four or five hours. It just depends on how quickly it downloads and uploads and all that. And uh, Becca will be following up with an email. And in that email, we will have a link to a survey, uh, our post-webinar survey. Uh, please, please, please take a few minutes and take it. We're really trying to dig into what we're doing right, how we can improve if things are too long, too short, what you would like to see from APIP. Uh, so please, um, fill that out for us so we can uh, make our webinars even better in the future. And I will hand it over to Maria. Thank you. You're muted, Maria. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Maria Moskali here from DEC Forest Health. I am going to give you a brief history of beech leaf disease and go over some of the research and show you how to how to identify it and its lookalikes. You can go far. Next. And you go next again. So the importance of American beech. American beech trees are an important component of the northern, for the northern hardwood forest type, which makes up more than half of the forested land in New York. Wildlife such as black bears, squirrels, mice, turkeys, and many others rely on beech nuts as a main source of energy due to their high protein and fat content. Predators such as owls, coyotes, and others are also affected by beech mass indirectly when their small mammal food source dwindles. Beech trees in New York have been in decline from beech bark disease since the 1960s, and now beech leaf disease is the latest threat. BLD causes severe decline in beech trees of all age classes with higher disease severity found in younger trees. Loss of beech would cause changes in forest structure that would affect the whole ecosystem. Next. Unfortunately, the forecast does not look good for beech trees. Beech leaf disease is spreading rapidly, as you can see in this map here. In North America, beech leaf disease was first found in Ohio in 2012. It has been observed spreading outward from there since. In New York, beech leaf disease has been found on American beech, European beech, and Oriental beech. Symptoms progress quickly over the years, and there's still much unknown. Next. In New York, DEC Forest Health first started hearing reports of striping on leaves and thinning beech canopies in 2017. We started tracking it as beech leaf disease the following year in 2018. At that time, the only detections were in the most southwestern part of the state. Every year since, we've seen a significant expansion of the disease range. And so far this year, we have found beech leaf disease in 11 new counties. Next. You can see in this map here all the positive towns found in New York, as well as the towns previously surveyed where it wasn't found. There were also a few unsure locations which will be resurveyed next year. 
This get, map gives a more detailed representation of the spread versus the county map. Note that this is a cumulative data and not all of the towns were surveyed this year. Next. Since beech leaf disease has only recently been recognized, its biology and vectors are not well understood. There is still much unknown and research is ongoing. Research by Carta found that the foliar nematode Litolancus crenati mechanii causes beech leaf disease symptoms. It is unknown whether the nematode is the full cause of the damage or if it is associated with another pathogen such as a fungus, virus, or bacteria. It is unknown how the disease spreads, but uh, birds and or wind are two of the main theories. Um, the first time that BLD is found in a new county, we send, we send samples to the Cornell Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic to confirm that the nematode is present. After that, we can confirm new locations with photos of the leaf symptoms. Next. For the annual BLD visual survey, beech trees are examined for symptoms of beech leaf disease and tallied as positive or negative. Severity of symptoms is then ranked. All of the positive and negative survey results from 2023 so far can be seen in this map here. We also get a lot of IMAP submissions, which are not included here, but they will be included in the final map for the year. Next. So um, tracking local spread. Um, this is our, our expansion study. DEC Forest Health is working on a small study to track the local spread of beech leaf disease in the forest. The study takes place in Cortland County at Kennedy State Forest. The BLD infestation was initially found in 2020 in a stand with scattered mature American beech, but most of the beech were understory. Um, in 2020 and 2021, BLD symptomatic trees were identified and flagged and a perimeter was mapped out around the area of infestation. In one year, the area of infestation expanded from about an acre, which you can see right in the middle there, to about four and a half acres. And then last year it expanded to about 15 acres and there were so many trees that we couldn't even count them. And so we just marked the perimeter last year. So it went from one acre to four and a half acres to about 15 acres. And in addition, there were all these like outlier jumps. For, so for each of these red dots, we found like one or two trees like about a mile away. And then there's this one polygon like up at the top here that we must have missed. And that had about a quarter acre of, of trees. Um, so that's what we saw last year. Um, so basically the area of vis visible infestation more than tripled each year for the first few years. Sorry, let me turn off my email. Sorry about that. Um, the area of infestation more than tripled each year in the first few years and then showed some outlier jumps a few trees further out. I expected about the same for this year with the outlier jumps expanding to maybe a quarter acre like seen in the outlier jump polygon, but that's not what happened. Next. Instead, we saw a crazy amount of expansion this year. This whole this whole area in the middle of previously asymptomatic trees just filled in this year. This, this whole area wasn't surveyed each year, but like we would walk along this road, like we would park up at, at the top of this fork up here and then walk like, I don't know, a mile or a mile and a half down to where the infestation was. And we would walk along this road like every day and never saw any symptomatic trees. And then this year they were all symptomatic with like moderate symptoms. Um, and yeah, so I was really shocked to see this amount of expansion this year with just the entire area filling in. Um, we're still working on the survey for this year. So this is just a screenshot of our working data. Um, the dots represent the found edge. And then it just, we would find it, like this is all gonna be cleaned up for the final map, but like we would find it and then it would just keep going like further out. Um, and then you can also see this is not even on the map. It just continues out like along these trails. Um, so many of these areas of edge where it stops, it ends up turning, it actually turns into other stand types, like up the top here, there's a lot of hemlock, um, down here, I think there's also hemlock and pine, and it just like, it kind of stops because there just isn't more beach. 
And then also, we've also uh, ran into the extent, this is on state land, and we've basically gotten to the edges of the state land because it expanded so much and we couldn't get um, all the landowner permissions around. So this will be the, the last year of the study because it's gotten to the whole area. Um, so, but this is, this is a very small study because this is the only location we really followed through on. Um, and there are still many factors unknown about beach leaf disease itself and how it spreads. Um, and there was a thinning in the first year, so we don't know how that affected the rate of spread. And then also point, I wanna point out that most of the symptomatic trees are small understory beach and beach rate regeneration. Um, and beech leaf disease does affect the lower canopy and understory first. So this is the sort of forest that it would move, we would think that it would move through quickly. Um, but yeah, just a crazy amount of expansion in just a few years. I don't, I don't know, since we're still working on this, I don't know what this whole area is, but the, this biggest polygon was 15 acres. So it's a lot of acres. Um, and then um, I think we'll have we'll have questions later too. I don't know if there's any um, I'm seeing. Oh, if you're using a pointer, yeah, it's not showing. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, if you guys have questions after, we can go over that. Okay, next. Plot monitoring. Um, so a network of monitoring plots was established to assess the symptom progression of beech leaf disease and the change in stand characteristics as the disease progresses. Um, from 2019 to 2022, and then again this year, plots were established across New York using a protocol provided by Cleveland Metro Parks. This is similar to the FIA pro protocol that the Forest Service uses. The stands are mixed hardwoods with American beach as a main component. Next. The 2019 plot data was used in a multi-state analysis showing the extent to which beech leaf disease, beech scale, and beech bark disease are established in forests surrounding the Great Lakes. Changes in forest structure and composition are expected. The results can be found in the paper read et al. 2022, this one. Unfortunately, if left unmanaged, invasive species such as buckthorn, honeysuckle, barberry, etc., have the potential to fill in gaps left by the declining beech and restoration work will have to include invasive species removal. Um, yeah. Okay, next. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some possible treatments next. Um, so far, they're encouraging prelim preliminary results from this study. Beach saplings were treated with polyphosphate 30 by soil drench twice a year for five years. Treated trees are much healthier than untreated trees. They have fuller canopies, more asymptomatic leaves, fewer symptomatic leaves, and five times fewer nematodes. They expanded the study to mature trees a couple years ago and will likely not have results for several years. They found that the polyphosphate treated trees maintain around 70% canopy compared to only 20% in the control. There was no difference in mild or heavy symptoms between the treated and control. And while it seems like this polyphosphate treatment is having a positive effect on maintaining canopy cover and a higher proportion of asymptomatic leaves, they still get BLD and they still have dieback. Um, it is unknown whether the severity of BLD symptoms is associated with nematode density, but this study did find a strong correlation showing that is the case. However, it is still unknown whether there are other microbes associated with the nematodes and whether the treatment is actually affecting the unknown microbes. Next. Okay, so treatments. Can BLD be managed by pesticides? There are a few products available to treat BLD in New York. You can hire a tree care company to apply them, but nothing has yet been proven effective and they may or may not be a waste of money. Research is ongoing. It is seeming like emomectin benzoate is turning out to not be very effective. Studies are not now focusing on broad form, which has been shown to kill nematodes. DEC Forest Health is conducting civil cultural research in cooperation with the Forest Service, for, Forest Service to look for ways to manage the beech forest to minimize the impacts. Next. Okay, so now I'm gonna be going over what you need to know to survey. Next. 
The ideal survey time is late May through October. Here you can see banding at leaf out and also in the fall. Next. The importance of pictures. This is the important part. I need good, clear pictures of the banding in order to confirm reports. Neither of these photos shows me clear evidence of BLD and I would have to mark it insufficient to confirm. So if I don't get a picture or if I get an unclear picture, then I'm not gonna be able to confirm it. Photos should be taken upwards through the light showing the banding. Also, please only submit one point per area. We don't need individual trees submitted or even different areas of the same area. If you're walking down a long trail and end up far from where you started, maybe you could submit a point at the beginning and the end, but overall one point per area is sufficient. Next. Okay, so the first thing you'll need to know is how to identify beech. Beech trees have smooth gray bark, though they often have beech bark disease, which makes the bark bumpy and are also frequently carved into in public places. Next. Beech leaves are simple and ovate and they have teeth. You can see here how every vein ends in a tooth and the leaves are not hairy or sandpapery. Next. Here you can see a comparison between Eastern Hophorn beam and American beech. You can see how on the Eastern Hophorn beam, each vein does not end in a tooth and there are many more teeth. Next. So the main symptoms to look for are the dark striping between the veins of the between the veins of the leaves. This is most visible looking upwards into the canopy. Later heavy banding can cover most of the leaf surface. This will impact the tree's ability to photosynthesize. After a few years of being infested, leaves will become deformed, chlorotic and have a thick and leathery texture. Symptoms of BLD generally progress from the bottom of the canopy upward, but can be found evenly distributed throughout the canopy. Unevenly distributed, sorry. They can be found randomly throughout the canopy. Likewise, it is found in the understory before the overstory. Damage from BLD occurs in the bud, and if damage to the buds is severe, then the leaves might not flush out in the spring. Thinning of the canopy happens over time due to early leaf drop and aborted bud development. Beech may reflush leaves in late June to replace heavy, heavily symptomatic leaves, and the new flush of leaves does not show symptoms. Next. So BLD symptoms are variable, so I'm going to show you several more examples of the symptoms as well as other beach problem lookalikes that you can encounter. Here you can see some examples of light to moderate banding. The dark striping on leaves is most visible looking upward through the light. Next. Here are a few more good clear photos of the dark banding. Next. So why do I keep saying hold the photos, up, hold the samples up to the light? Um, here is a good example. These are the same leaves, the first, the first photo taken looking down, and you can see how it's unclear whether each leaf disease is present. Next. Then the same leaves shown through the light and the dark banding is clearly visible. So you can see the difference. I mean, if I saw the first photo, I, I would say that looks suspicious, but I don't really, I couldn't really tell you for sure. And then in the second photo, the same leaves. Oh, that's, that's so clear. Definitely beech leaf disease. So it's really important. Next. Okay. So here's a practice to see if you can spot the BLD symptoms in the photo. This is what I have to do for the IMAP confirmations. Okay, next. There you go. See, there it is. Okay, next. Okay, next. There you go. Next. Mm -hmm. And next. Yeah, so there's a few spots. Sometimes I have to like really zoom in to see it. And I understand like sometimes the canopy is like really far away. So you just have to do the best that you can with the situation that you have. Okay, next. 
Okay, so now for the heavy symptoms, heavily infested leaves are shrunken, curled, and leathery in texture. Next. Symptoms progress to puckering, curling, chlorosis, and necrosis. Next. And at the latest stages, there will be deformed, leathery, and possibly shrunken leaves. So this is like late stage BLD. Okay, next. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over some other problems that you might encounter on beach, including erineum patches, aphid damage, and anthracnose. Uh, symptoms are also very variable on these issues and can look very similar to BLD in some cases. Remember, it's always better to report even when unsure and make sure to get good, clear photos. Chlorosis is like the yellowing when the, when the leaves turn like this yellow color. And then necrosis is when um, they uh, die off, they turn brown and like crinkly and start like dying off in spots. Okay, next. Okay, so the first look like that you might encounter is this Araneum gall. Um, this is very, this is similar to beech leaf disease in that it's a gall, which is the plant's response to the organism. Um, this is caused by areophid mites. It causes like a felt like patch on top of the leaf. Um, you can go next. So for the Aeroneum patch, there will be a felt like area on the surface of the leaf, leaf and there might be some puckering on the other side. Um, most of the time I see light spotting like you can see in these photos, but then in more severe cases, there might be like striping like you see in the, the bottom photos. Like if there's so much of the patch that it causes striping and that's where um, some yeah. people might find it like a little confusing with the beech leaf disease along with like the puckering because there is some puckering with the beech leaf disease too. I tried to find pictures that looked most alike. Um, yeah, you can take a look at those. Okay, um, BLD doesn't have that felt like patch and the thickened area takes up the entirety between the vein. So it goes um, fully between the vein as opposed to just like part of it. Okay, next. The next lookalike is aphid damage. This is also very common. All of these that I'm showing you are very common and you're, you're likely to see all of these. Um, you can see here, oh, sorry. Um, aphids will cause a lighter banding versus the darker banding of beech leaf disease. Next. So you can see here how the aphid curls are much tighter curl on part of the leaf, whereas BLD curls are an overall distortion of the entire leaf. So like if you look at this bottom picture, it's a very tight curl just at like just at the bottom, whereas the BLD is just like overall distortion. And then you can also see like the aphids are like a much, they're a lighter banding. It's not a darker banding. It's a lighter banding. And it's like stippling on like the top of the leaf. Um, also, sometimes when you turn mm -hmm. over the leaf, you can see the aphid casings. So that's another clip. Okay, next. Okay, so the final look like we're gonna go over today is anthracnose, which on beach looks like patches of necrotic tissue, usually on the end with the tip, but it could be on the side as well. Next. And here is anthracnose versus beach leaf disease. Um, BLD necrotic tissue can be along the side or striping. Okay, next. Mm, back one. Okay, so and then here is some Japanese beetle feeding damage. Um, and then so like um, from a distance, you you might think like, oh, the whole the whole leaf is getting that whole striped, like um, in advanced stages of beech leaf disease, the entire leaf will get striped. So you might, you might see this and then think that there is some striping going on, or maybe it's the whole leaf is striped. But then when you get closer, you can see that there's actually like feeding damage. 
And Japanese beetles go after all sorts of plants and trees. They're not like specific to beech trees. They just like everything. So this is another thing that you might get confused with. Okay, next. Um, and like I said, um, treatments are being researched, but unfortunately nothing has been proven effective at stopping BLD yet. DEC Forest Health staff are cleaning their boots with a boot brush and currently Lysol. Sorry, I forgot to change that slide. But we are currently using Lysol. Um, that is easier. And I think that's been found more effective. And then also you don't have to worry about remixing the bleach every day and or getting it on your clothing because it definitely ruins clothing. Um, so we are using Lysol. Try to avoid moving soil leaf matter on boots and don't move firewood. Mm -hmm. Next. So that's it. Here are some of the sources that I've cited and taken photos from. Next. For more information, please visit the BLD webpage um, at this uh, address, or you can just uh, Google search NYS DEC BLD. Um, so I just want to make a note that the we're currently updating the web page and the new web page is not available yet. And the old web page we cannot update at this time. Uh, so the map on there is not up to date. But the maps that I showed you guys today are up to date. Um, and the, the beach leaf disease website will get updated as soon as we are able to have access to it. But it was up, it, this information is um, good from last year. The only main thing that we would change is add the updated map, which you guys saw today with the 11 new counties. Um, next. For outreach material, there is the beach leaf disease flyer available on the web page. Um, and so if you want brochures or outreach materials to print out, you can print this out. Um, it's a good resource. Uh, next. And I just want to remind everyone to report beach leaf disease through IMAP. And if you have any questions, if you have any other questions about tree problems, you can email foresthealth at dec.ny.gov. Next. And so I guess we probably do have like a few minutes for questions. Let me see. Can you get the slides? Yeah, you can have the slides. We are recording the entire webinar and it will, should be available hopefully in four hours or so. Does anyone else have any questions? Someone asked, what is okay. chlorosis? I think you may have explained that, but. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that when it came up. So I mentioned at the time, but it's that yellowing um, on the leaves. That's not specific to beach or beach leaf disease. That's just like a, a term for tree problems. Oh. Does anyone else have any questions for Maria? Uh, where in Warren was it found? It was found at uh, Edgecombe Pond. Yeah. Um, okay, so I am curious whether you have seen Tree of Heaven grow into areas where beech have already died. We have a growing population of Tree of Heaven near the BLD fine. Um, so we, the mortality, like this is all very new um, and mortal the mortality is not happening like super quickly. Like we are only now possibly seeing some mortality downstate, um, possibly in Westchester and Suffolk counties. Um, but we haven't, there hasn't really been areas in New York where the beach have completely died off yet from this. Um, that's something I'm expecting like this year and in the future, like uh, close future years that we're gonna be seeing more and more of that, but we haven't really been seeing beach die off yet. So we haven't come into that yet. Um, but I would just imagine that anything that is around and, and likes, you know, any pioneer species or trees that like gaps and light 
and other invasive species would start filling in. Um, so if you, so yeah, so I mean, that is a possibility that the tree of heaven could start filling in near your BLD find um, that could happen. Um, I know like with, when the ash tree started dying off, it was just, you know, whatever was already there, box elder in a lot of cases and other invasive species. Um, is it possible to have a group meeting in the field to observe BLD? Um, maybe that's something that APIP could set up for you. Yeah, Bill, let's have some internal conversations and see if that's something we can we can do. And, and I would say too, if people are interested in that, please do the survey I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Becca is going to be sending an email, and it will have that information uh, how to take the survey. So if you would be interested in attending, um, you know, there, there's a couple uh kind of open uh questions that you can type in answers to maybe make note that you'd be interested in attending that somewhere in that survey so we can get a sense for how many people would like to to join it uh then uh tamara asks about the current guidelines for sourcing fired firewood and the distance um i'm not sure i would search on the dec webpage for that um also maybe jason denham knows possibly um, and is there a relationship with, between BLD and beech bark disease? Um, well, so that is something that was studied in the paper that I mentioned by Reed. Um, that is, uh, hold on. Yeah, Reed et al in 2022 that because that's something when we do the plots we do collect data on beech leaf disease and beech bark disease um and it is something that they discussed in that paper um now they're not nest they're not related like beech bark disease is caused by like um an insect and a fungus and that they're still trying to figure out um beech leaf disease that there is a nematode involved and they're trying to figure out if there is something else involved. Um, but they do seem to be two different things. And now you can definitely get them on the same tree. And I would think that the trees that have both of those would decline faster. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so. Don't mind, I'll jump in with the, the firewood. So New York state law says that we can transport firewood up to 50 miles. <laughs> However, you know, I've seen places where invasive forest pests have been transported by firewood, you know, less than 50 miles. So we always encourage you to buy your firewood as close to where you're going to burn it as possible. Um, that heat treated firewood, the stuff that you can buy, at, you know, your local convenience store that is able to be transported more than 50 miles because it's been essentially treated so any invasive pests in it should have been killed in that process. Thank you. These are good questions. Do you guys have any more? All right, well, if you okay. think of anything else, feel free to ask later. We'll, we'll have more time for questions later on as well. And let's move on. So I just want to thank Maria for spending some time with us today. You know, that first section in particular was quite sobering. Just seeing the rate of spread at, at that plot is, is incredible. You know, this thing just spreads so fast and it, it tends to jump. You know, we see it in places where there's not an infestation front, which is really scary. Yeah, I thought it was spreading fast before. I, th I thought that our previous rate of spread was crazy. And then we got to this year and it's just insane. It's sobering. Um, and that's why, you know, this program is so important. And, you know, I think that everyone on here is here to learn about beech leaf disease, but hopefully interested in getting involved in all, as well. So Sean, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So we run our Forest Pest Hunters Beach Leaf Disease program each year. This is our second year hosting it. We're kicking it off a little bit earlier this year. 
but through this program, you can get involved in survey for beach leaf disease and enter those findings into IMAP invasives, which is going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes here. And Maria kind of touched on that as well. But IMAP invasives is a state tool. Um, it's an online application. You can use it on your phone and you can use it to upload reports. And then Maria will be able to, to confirm those reports. Our program involves adopting a trial or surveying a trial of your choosing. So I just want to take a few minutes and talk about safety out on the trail. So whenever we head out, we want to be prepared. So before hitting the trail, we, you know, we want to know what we're looking for. So learn to identify beach as well as beach leaf disease. Um, you're here today. That's a great first step. We also have a beach leaf disease survey protocol that will be shared um, with the email this afternoon. And it's also available on APIP's website, as well as the sign-up map I'm going to talk about in a few moments. It's a great idea to print that and have that in your backpack with you or to download it onto your phone and have an offline copy on your phone. Because anyone here in the field that has pictures of beach leaf disease has pictures of the lookalikes. So if you have any question, you have those pictures to refer to. Before heading out, you always want to make sure, also want to make sure you have that IMAP invasives app set up on your phone and ready to go so that you can take those pictures and make those reports. You want to sign up for a trial if you're signing up for a trial. And just like any other hike you're going to do, you want to review the directions to the trailhead, make sure you know where you're going. You want to review the trail and plan a route. You know, maybe there's a lot of trail junctions and you, you want to know where you want to head that day. And as always, you want to check the weather, check the trail conditions, especially with all the flooding we've been having here in the Adirondacks. And we are getting into the time of year when days are getting shorter. So I always check those sunrise and sunset times so you can be out of the woods before dark sets in. Next slide, please, Sean. So what are the tools of the trade that we're going to need to survey for beach leaf disease? You know, like any sort of hiking, we're going to want sturdy shoes and weather appropriate clothing. We're going to want a GPS enabled smartphone to record our, our observations and IMAP invasives. And we want that app downloaded on the phone and set up we also want to have the beach leaf disease protocol with us for the reasons I just talked about. We are heading out on the trail, so we always want to have the 10 essentials with us. We want to have a navigation tools, a map, and a compass. So you can print the picture of the map, you know, from our website. You can find DEC maps. We always want to have sun protection, sunglasses, sunscreen to protect ourselves. We never know when, you know, an unexpected rainstorm is going to come in or something unexpected is going to happen. So we want to have extra clothes clothes, as well as illumination if we get caught out in the dark. We always want to have first aid supplies, fire, so waterproof matches, a lighter, that sort of thing. We may want to have a small repair kit and tools, so maybe a knife, some cordage, some duct tape, just some stuff in our pack in case something goes wrong, as well as extra food and water and an emergency shelter. Next slide, please, Sean. I keep hitting the arrow. I'm so used to advancing my own slides. So upon hitting the trail, you can survey as much or as little of this trail as you like. Um, if you sign up for one of the trails on our sign up map, we can just about guarantee that there are beach along those trails because we have overlaid the trails layer with the beach layer to, to ensure that there are beach for you to survey. But they might not be at, right at the trailhead, so you may need to walk a little ways to find them. Like Maria said, we don't need a point for every tree, but what is really helpful um, is points where you start and stop surveying. So maybe you're gonna hike a mile up the trail, you hike the mile up the trail, you're surveying and as you go, you get to where your turnaround point is, you have found no beach leaf disease, so you enter a non-detect, you come back to the trailhead, you're keeping an eye out for beach leaf disease on your way back. And then when you get back to your car at the trailhead, you enter another non-detect. And now we know between those two points, someone surveyed and they have not found beach leaf disease. The same things happens, you know, maybe you're walking that trail and you do find a spot with beach leaf disease. And drop that point. You know, maybe you're walking the whole in another hour, you're finding beach leaf disease that whole way. Enter another detection point at your turnaround point and walk back. In general, what we're going to do is we're going to start our hike. We're going to be on the lookout for beach. And when we encounter a beach leaf stand, we're going to stop and look for signs of beach leaf disease. So, like Maria said, on some of these really light infestations, where you don't see it on every side of the tree. You kind of got to look around, look up into the branches, check all sides of the tree, look at several trees in the stand. You can spend about 10 minutes in a spot scouting, looking at different trees, looking at different angles of those same trees. Then you can hike on until you find the next beach stand. If you're on a trail that's very densely populated with beach trees, you can wait 10 minutes of hiking before you survey the next stand. 
And just as a reminder, those signs of beech leaf disease that we're looking for are really those darkened strip between the leaf veins. And as Maria said, those, those are most visible by looking at the underside of the leaves by looking up into the canopy with the light coming through. We can also look for those curled leaves with a leather, leathery texture, excuse me. Next slide, Sean. As we've, Maria, Maria and I have both talked about, it's really, really important to enter these observations into IMAP. Not detections are just as important as detections here, folks, because then we know that someone was out there, they took a look around and they didn't see anything. And that can help us um, as professionals better target our surveys. Remember, we don't need a point for every tree, just every area. And as Maria said, those high quality photos are really, really important. So we wanna take a picture of the leaf from the underside of the leaf, light shining through. Maria had that great slide showing, you know, just a leaf in someone's hand with the ground in the background as opposed to light. And you could really see that difference. Maria will use those photos to confirm that beech leaf disease is in an area. So those pictures are really, really important. Next slide, Sean. And just some quick, you know, who, what, where, when for hunting for beech leaf disease. So the detection time, as Maria mentioned, is any time the, the beech are in leaf. We can even see this on senesce leaves in the fall. However, our program, the Beech Leaf Disease Force Pimps Stunters Program will run from today, August 2nd until October 10th. Remember, we're only gonna see this on beech trees. So I have some pictures of what beech trees look like here on the left. Remember they have that smooth bark that folks like to carve their names into and beech leaves have wavy edges. So I'm going to steal a quote from Brent Boscarino down in the Lower Hudson Prism. He says, think of going to the beach. So when you're at the beach, you see waves, and the edge of the beech leaves are wavy. The location we're going to look for for that beech leaf disease is going to be on the underside of the leaves, and we're looking for the foliage cues of that dark banding, the leathery or rawhide-like texture, and we're going to see this by looking up into the canopy. And remember, it's most visible when holding the leaves to the light. Next slide, Sean. So we'll now we'll talk about adopting a trial. Next slide, Sean. And we have two options. So you're welcome to go survey your backyard and report. You know, I think a lot of us have interest in whether this pest is in our own woodlot or the woodlots we manage. And that's great for us to know personally, but even better is to upload those reports, those detections and non-detections to IMAP invasives so that we can all work together to try to figure out where this forest pest is. If you want to survey along your forest favorite trail, that's great, great information as well. As well. However, we do have a tree adoption sign-up map um, that folks can use. Um, if you bear with me for a moment, I will share my screen so that I can share that with you. Sean, can you confirm you're seeing the sign up map? Awesome. So the link to the sign up map will be shared with folks uh, after the webinar with the recording. And when you land on this page, you will see this landing page. It reminds you of a little bit of background about beech leaf disease. It reminds you to be prepared when you're out on the trail. So have those 10 essentials. Be safe out on the trail and follow leave no trace principles. It reminds you of our survey season and that it will wrap up on October 10th. And it also links you to the IMAP Invasives webpage so that you can sign up for the app and get it all set up on your phone. We can go ahead and click OK. And we'll see a map here. So on the top banner, we actually have a link to the survey protocol. I've already loaded that up here. And this is what the survey protocol looks like. So as we scroll through, we'll see our survey materials. So what we need to have with us on the trail. It walks us through how to set up the IMAP Invasives mobile app, which Mitch is going to talk about after me, before we go in the field. Then it walks you through how to select a survey site if you're using the sign-up map, which I'm going to talk through in a moment here. Now, the next step is what you should do on that survey. So what we talked about, walk until you encounter a stand of beach, survey all sides of the trees, and then hike on. Then tells you how to enter your detection or non-detection in the IMAP, which again, Mitch is going to cover in a moment. And then the, the most handy part for when we're in the field, folks, is it has pictures of what beach trees look like, both healthy beach, beach tree, beach bark, and a tree with beach bark disease, as well as leaves and twigs. And then we have some great photos here of beech leaf disease um, to refer back to. 
We also have from the DEC website, we've added an appendix with a lot of pictures of BE, BLD lookalikes that Murray talked about. So you have that with you. There's also a link up here to IMAP invasives to again, get those accounts set up. And a link to APIP speech leaf disease page where you can learn more. When we look at the map here, we will see a bunch of dots. So orange dots are trails that are available for sign up. Red dots are trails that are available for sign up, but they're a little bit higher priority because these ones are in the area where there is known beach leaf disease. As someone adopts a, a trail, which we're going to do in a few moments here, um, the green the dots will turn green. We can zoom in or out using these buttons or using the scroll wheel on our mouse. We can change the background if you wanted an aerial map um, right here. And as we zoom in, the trails will start to show up. I also want to point out that if you're, say, coming up to the Adirondacks for vacation, and you know you're going to be in Lake George, you could type Lake George into here, and it would take you to Lake George, and you can look around for trails to sign up for. So say I am in the Indian Lake area, and I want a trail to sign up for. If I look over here, Looks like there is a trailhead here and it's available. It's orange, so I can click on that and it tells me it's the Lake Rock, the Rock Lake Trail parking lot. I can look around and oh, a little bit slow to load there, folks. And I can say, oh, maybe I want to take this hike around Rock Lake and head up here. That's going to be my route. So now I have a planned route. And then I can click on the stop. And I can sign up now, which I'll do in a second. And what's really cool also is it has um, a button to view the approximate location in Google Maps. So you can click that, type in your address, see how long it's going to take you to get there and what the route looks like for your field day planning. When we click sign up now, it's going to take us to this sign up page. The site name and priority are going to automatically pop up for you. Then you'll fill, up, fill out the registration date, which is the date you sign up for the trail, your full name. your email address, and then your IMAP person ID number. So I happen to know mine is 19974. But if you don't know that number, there's a great little link here that walks you through how to find that number for us. It's going to ask you if you've previously per, um, participated as a forest pest hunter. I have. So I can click yes. And then do you have any notes for us? You know, Do you have a question you, you need answered? Are you happy about the program? That sort of thing. You can type them in here. Then you're going to click our disclaimer and liability waiver, read through that, accept the terms and conditions, and hit submit. Now, when we return to the map, and give it a second to load here. Must know I want to display things, folks. It's loading a little slower than normal. We can see that that trial has been adopted and it's now turning green. I will stop sharing. And Sean can pop the PowerPoint back up. Got it. Awesome. And I think we can cool. move to the next slide, Sean. Awesome. I'll take a few of these quick questions before we move to Mitch. So Bill asks, should we include a small bottle of bleach in our Paxwell survey? thinking it would be a good to treat your shoes between, before returning from the trail. I think, you know, Bill, what Maria was saying is, you know, maybe Lysol works a little bit better and, you know, has a little bit less chance of ruining your clothes as well as you don't have to worry about mixing that bleach in. So maybe, you know, a small thing of Lysol in your bleach might be the best option. Derek makes a great point that given that this detection starts in the uh, canopy, it might be great information to share with the New York State Ornithological community, and I think that's great. You know, those folks are always out looking up. Um, and Tamara asks, is this survey statewide or inside the blue line only? Um, so this, our project does run within our APIP PRISM service area. So our APIP PRISM service area does include um, all of the Adirondack Blue Line, as well as Clinton and Franklin counties north to the Canadian border. However, if you are out surveying in other parts of the state, please, please, please 
put that survey data in um, IMAP invasives. Um, we encourage folks from all across the state to survey. Just if you want to use our survey map, there are only trails in that map within the Adirondack region. And with that, I'll pass it to Mitch. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for having me, Sean and Becca. Um, so my name is Mitch O'Neill. I work with the New York Natural Heritage Program um, on the IMAP Invasives team. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So some of you might be familiar with IMAP. It's the, the database used in New York State for invasive species. It's used by the PRISMs like APIP, um, state agencies like DEC, and all sorts of other partners, and as well as volunteers and the general public too. And like I mentioned, it's administered by the New York Natural Heritage Program for New York. And so today I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how to use IMAP for this program. Um, so that involves mostly setting up an IMAP account and also setting up your uh, field data collection tool that you can go out into the go out onto the trail and report your observations and then upload them when you get back. And so I'm going to be sort of brief and overviewy. Um, but if you need a more uh, extensive like step by step, um, the first place to look would be that protocol that Becca was showing. So that kind of lays out all the steps um, that I'll go through um, at sort of an overview -y level in a second. Um, and we also have like videos online and stuff that you can use if you want to uh, follow along to a video. Oh, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first thing to do is to go to our website, um, nyimapinvasives.org. Uh, next slide or next. Uh, yeah, so there's a login button at the top right uh, next. And so that brings you to our account creation slash login page um, next. So if you already have an account, um, you can log in at the top. Just put in your username and password and your username is the email you used next. Um, and if you have trouble getting in, but you know you have an account, you might uh, that forget, forgot password might help. Um, you can reset your password. But if you're still having problems, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I do have my email um, later on in the presentation. Uh, next. And so if you don't have an account yet, you just put in your information in the sign up box. So your name, email, you make yourself a password. And for jurisdiction, that's just the state or province where you're collecting data. Um, so that'll be New York for most people here. Uh, next. And just a reminder, when you hit that join button, that creates your account, but it's not actually immediately ready to use. Um, so an, an email will be sent to the email you put in um, to activate your account. Basically, you just have to look at the IMAP terms and conditions and accept those, um, and that also verifies your email address. Um, so once you create your account, please make sure to uh, check your inbox and accept the agreement to activate your account. And if you don't see that email, sometimes it ends up in the junk or spam folder. Um, for Gmails, that usually happens. Um, for other emails, it just goes into your normal inbox, um, but keep an eye out for that. Next. And um, so hopefully that works out and then you'll be able to log in. And this is what it looks like when you first log in. Um, so there will be a little, uh, window that pops up just telling you uh, last time it was updated, that sort of stuff. Um, you can close that out next. And and then this is what it'll look like. So I'll just go through quickly kind of what the online interface looks like. Um, there is a lot of functionality on here. Um, it's not required by any means, means to use most of this functionality. So mostly you just need to set up your, your account online. Um, and then you just use the app to do your, your quick observations. But I'll just show you quickly what's kind of available on the online interface next. So there's the main menu on the top left. Um, that's just to look at like the, the species that are tracked in New York State, um, look at your account, that sort of stuff. Um, if you go to, if you click on that and click the your account page, that's how you find your IMAP person ID, which Becca mentioned um, next. And then on the left-hand side, that's where you can zoom in, zoom out, enter your address or your town to zoom the map in. Next. 
On the top are a whole bunch of action tools. Um, so there's a create record option. Um, that's sometimes helpful if you, maybe you, you saw beech leaf disease and you took a picture and noted where it was, but for some reason you didn't enter it in the mobile app or something and you want, want to create it afterwards, um, you could always go in online um, and use that create record tool. Um, but in general, the, the mobile app is probably going to be more useful for, for most people here, so you probably won't be using um, these action tools. And next, on the, yeah, next. Uh, so, and then those are just the geographic layers, so you can turn on layers like unconfirmed or not detected. Uh, you can change the base map. Um, and I'll mention on the those action tools that I just glazed over, one of them is filter records, and there's an option to filter on your own records. Um, so after you've done all this work surveying, if you want to look at what you've you've entered, you can log in and filter on your own records and then see a map of the points you've put in. And just remember to toggle on um, any layers. So if you, by default, it just shows you the confirmed presences. Um, so if you just submitted records yesterday, they might not have been confirmed yet. So make sure you turn on unconfirmed. Um, and if you you entered not detected records, you need to turn on that layer as well. Um, but again, most of this is all optional. The, the main thing to use for this program will be the mobile app. Next. Um, and then the uh, one important thing to do on the online interface is to join uh, the Forest Pest Project. And again, the protocol that um, Becca has goes through this step by step. Um, but it's essentially just going to the project page and then clicking the request to join button. Um, if you don't, and the, the link to the project page is on the slide and also um, will be sent out to people. Um, but if you don't see that request to join project, that might mean you didn't log into IMAP yet. Um, if you did log into IMAP, then it probably just means that um, you're already you're already part of it. So if you are a returning volunteer, for example, you're probably already part of this project and don't have to worry about it again for this year because you already joined. Next. And then, so once you have your uh, account all set up, then you're ready to use the mobile app. Um, so it's, you can find it in your, your app store. If you just search IMAP Invasives um, and it looks like this, um, it's a application designed for quick point records, presence are not detected. Uh, and it, it, once you configure it, you can use it out on the trail with no internet connection. Um, and then you just upload them when you get back in. Um, next slide. One thing I do want to note, um, there is currently an issue for Android users. So if you use, if you are, use, have an iPhone, it won't affect you. Um, if you have an older Android, it won't affect you. Um, and if you already have IMAP installed, um, it won't affect you. But for anyone who's new to IMAP and has a more modern Android running version 11 or higher, if you go to your Play Store, you'll be able to find IMAP Invasives, um, but it'll have this little message on it saying that it's uh, like not supported under the current version of Android because um, there's a recent Google update. Um, and so we did figure out how to how to solve that. Um, so we have a test version running right now, um, but we really want to make sure that nothing else goes wrong. So we're kind of testing it this week. Um, and if if everything's continuing to work, we're hopeful that we'll publish it next week. Um, but if you are one of the, the people with a more modern Android and you're really hoping to go out this weekend and you can't download the mobile app, um, First of all, sorry for the inconvenience, but there are a couple options. So you could use our survey one, two, three form, you could report online, um, or you can just upload your records uh, once the, the, the mobile app is fixed, hopefully next week. Um, and if there are any questions or confusion about this, I'll be happy to talk about this more at the end. Um, but overall, uh, if you already have the app or if you go into the store and it lets you download the app, you're all good. It'll be pretty clear if it's not working and you can feel free to reach out to us and we can help you uh, figure out what to do. Um, next. And so the basic workflow of the mobile app is that you 
you first you download the app and you set up, you get it connected to your account, you configure your preferences, and you do that um, while you have internet. So before you go out and survey, um, but then you are ready to go once it's configured. So you could go out on the trail, record some observations. It saves those to your phone. Um, but since you are, you're not connected to Wi-Fi, you're out in the wilderness somewhere, um, those records are just on your phone. They're not visible to people like Maria or Becca yet. Um, so there's a very important last step where when you get back home, uh, you have to click a button that says upload selected, and then that puts all of your records into the online database where everyone can see them. And at that point, you'll see them disappear off your phone. Um, and that's kind of a good indicator. Uh, so if you see records on your phone, that means they're on your phone, um, they're saved, they're, they're ready to go, uh, but only you can see them. Um, what you wanna do is upload those and always see a blank screen afterwards. Um, so that means that the only thing uh, that means that everything has left your phone and is in the online database. Next slide. Uh, next. And uh, so Maria uh, gave a really good, uh, gave some really good notes on this, but good photos are essential. So for beech leaf disease in particular, um, not only uh, are, does it need to be focused and close up, uh, but it's really important to take it from underneath with the light shining through. Um, so that it's very clear that it's speech leaf disease. Um, it really saves a lot of time and also makes it uh, a lot more efficient to confirm these reports more easily. Next. And then uh, just a couple tips um, for the online. Uh, just make sure you activate your account. That's, that's a common uh, thing that happens. Like you create your account and then try to get in and it doesn't work. It's often because you haven't checked for that activation email and followed that, followed those instructions. Uh, so please, please uh, reach out if you have any issues there. And then some tips on the mobile app. Uh, so one, uh, make sure you set your preferences. Um, so there's that step of, uh, it's shown in this image on the right hand side. So you you put in your state, you put in your uh, username and password, and then click retrieve IMAP lists. And that's what kind of sets your whole account up. It connects you, connects your app to your account online, which will let you um, upload your records at the end. Um, and it also brings in the New York species list. Um, and it also brings in any projects that you're a part of. So if you're on your mobile app and you know you joined the project, but it's not coming up on your mobile app, one what the first thing you should do is go in and click that retrieve IMAP list button again. Um, so that's a very important step uh, to, to get done. Um, and then number two, I always recommend that you test it out first. Um, so we have a species in our system called fake species, which is just there so that you can test things out. Um, so Rather than trying it for the first time when you're out on the trail and it's harder to, to troubleshoot and figure out what's going wrong, we recommend just going through the whole process once um, when you're at home. So uh, just select fake species um, and and save that record and then upload it to see to see how the whole process works and make sure you you understand it before you get out in the field. Um, and since it's fake species, it's kind of just a test record and it won't uh, cause any problems. Um, also a reminder to report those not detected surveys, really helpful for Becca to be able to see where you've searched but not, not found it. Um, and also just a reminder to upload uh, those records. So after you've done all that work out in the field um, and recorded all that data, it's really important to make sure those, those records actually get to IMAP invasives where Maria and Becca can see them. Next. And in terms of help resources, uh, the first place to go will be that protocol document that Becca was showing. Um, but if you um, are having some other IMAP issues or you wanna look at uh, one of our videos to kind of go through it in a video format, um, then go to our training page on our website or email us. Um, at imapinvasives at dec.my.gov. Next. And just so you're aware, um, 
what I showed today, that's all you need for, for participating in this project. But if you are interested in some of the other stuff in IMAP, like setting up email alerts for your county or something to see what's being reported in your county or uh, uh, viewing the, the distributions of certain species, um, that sort of stuff, feel free to uh, reach out to us to learn more about that or visit our website. Um, and also, uh, we do a, a monthly webinar um, starting up again in September, so feel free to look out for those um, and go to our website for other uh, training and information. Uh, next. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for, for having me, um, and thank you all for participating in this really cool uh, program. We look forward to the uh, data coming into IMAP. Hey, does anyone have any questions for Mitch or even even Becca or Maria? I'm not seeing anything new in the chat. Hey, well, if you think of anything, you can always reach out to myself or Becca or Mitch or Maria and uh, with, your, with your questions. All right, mark your calendars. We have a uh, Lake Protectors in-person training. This is kind of the aquatic version of the Forest Pest Hunters program. Uh, this one's going to be held down in Long Lake, and it's going to be really fun. It'll be in person. Uh, you'll get to take a boat out with uh, Brian Green, who will be leading it. He's our aquatic um, invasive species coordinator. Uh, so yeah, if you're in the Long Lake area and you want to learn about how to monitor for some aquatic invasive species, um, this would be a good chance to do that. All right, and last call for questions. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Please, um, oh, we do have a new message. If you should find BLD, do you want us to flag with orange ribbon or collect samples? Maybe. Only if it's in a new county and it's like a remote spot that would be difficult for someone else to get back to. But um, probably we could take care of the samples. But but pot, like if it's in a brand new county, um, but it, you, there's also, you have to take into consideration, um, never cut into anyone's tree without their permission. So definitely no one should be taking any samples if you don't have permission. Um, Cause I think I've worked with you in the past in a remote location and then you got samples for it. Um, but I think most of the time we would go back and get the sample because we'd want to make sure that we had the correct permissions and that we didn't just the right way. I would say in most most cases, you would not be collecting samples, but possibly it might happen, if that answers the question. Uh, most cases, we would just go back and collect the sample. Um, but if it is a new county, it might help to, to flag it with flagging if it I mean, because in some cases, it really is just the one tree and like the one branch. So like if it's a new county um, and in the APIP region, it's, it's so far just Warren County that we have confirmed. So the other counties, we have not found it in or confirmed anything. So I guess if it's like, if it's not going to be, if, it, if it's just one tree that, that you're seeing um, that has the, um, the symptoms, then you could flag that if you happen to have flagging, probably don't worry about the sample. Um, yeah, and just make sure you get good coordinates, but you'll do that through the IMAP anyway. And we have a couple of requests for the Long Lake information that's up on the screen right now. And you can also go to uh, adkinvasives.com slash events to register or learn more about other upcoming events. Uh, we're, we're gonna have some more coming up in the next month or so. Uh, as well. So just keep an eye on that page. Uh, we have a question here. If we find evidence of other invasives, should we document and report them also? Sure. I know the answer to that. <laughs> so please, if you do encounter other invasive species on the trail, we definitely encourage you to, to drop a point on that for those species as well. 
Once signed up for a trail, if we find BLD, should we only collect one point in IMAP for that entire trail network? I would say uh, uh, maybe two. So maybe where you first start encountering it and then where you run out, out of it or where you stop surveying for the day. And the same thing with those non records, you know, where you start yeah. and where you stop surveying for the day. So we can kind of make a judgment call that it was found or not found between those two points. I agree. Are there natural or biological agents available to fight BLD? No, but it is being researched. It's we're starting we're starting research on those things, um, but nothing has yet been found. Um, I mean, so far the most promising results were from the polyphosphate, which is the fertilizer. If we somehow missed your question in chat, please feel free to unmute and ask. Um, and I would say at this point, if you have a question, you could just unmute and ask. Um, And folks, I will also okay. include the information for the Long Lake training in today's follow-up email. Um, it seems like a lot of folks have interest in that. Um, and as Sean said, that should be available. I should be sending that email sometime today. However, sometimes YouTube and Box are a little finicky, so sometimes it may be tomorrow if we run into a few issues, but it will be coming. Yeah, it's really just a matter of how quickly I can get the video from, from Zoom and then how quickly I can get it onto YouTube. But as long as it goes smoothly, it should be up this afternoon. If no one has any more questions. All right, well, thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate it.